Hi, my name is Lee Feinswag. I'm the uh, co-publisher and editor of volleyballmag.com slash volleyball magazine. And I live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I'm all fired up about talking about all of that with Jody. I love this. You didn't really say that we'll call it the elevator pitch, but I don't care because we're going to sit there and talk about this. So I'm excited to talk to you because um, so the nickname of Big Lee is like, Lee, you're a big guy. Um, and um, oh, well, do you want to you, you want to know how that came about? Well, yeah. OK, so and Jody's friends with my daughter, Stacy, who has two children and the love, oldest. Love my Stacey. I love my Stacy. Right. So when uh, her daughter, Sydney, who Sydney's now about 12 and a half. And when she was in route, um, it became a, a subject and a, and a matter of family controversy about what they were going to call me. And so you have to back up to uh, me moving to the south. And I live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where adults are often referred to as, uh, you know, Miss Nancy or Mr. Jim. Mm -hmm. Well, I always have made the joke that Mr. Lee sounds like a Chinese laundry and I don't like being called Mr. Lee and I just want to be called Lee. So my name is Lee. So if we, we have uh, for 20 years, I ran Volleyball Baton Rouge, which is Girls Club Volleyball tournament, uh, uh, Organization. And you can ask a kid who played even in the early 2000s, um, what are the first three rules of volleyball Baton Rouge? And they'll always go, well, the first one is don't call him Mr. Lee. So, <laughs> so anyway, so leading up to uh, Stacy's, you know, arrival of Sydney, it was like, all right, you know, I wasn't going to go with like a grandpa thing or whatever. It just not yeah, me. Yeah, you don't look like, you know, the type of person that would like go for grandpa. No, no, you know, whatever. Or, you know, all the various names that you might give to um, someone of that ilk. And I said, you know, I really just like rather the kid call me Lee, you know, in future kids call me Lee. Well, that was just getting everybody's nose bent out of shape. So one day before she was born, Stacy called me and she goes, Hey, could you live with big Lee? And I said, yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that. You know, cause I'm, I'm also the biggest person in the family, you know, bigger than, you know, Stacy's brother, Kirk and, um, you know, everybody else for that matter. So, Big Lee stuck. Now, what's funny is how the kids, the different ones say it. You know, it's so, some of it's like all one word, like Big Lee. And, you know, like uh, Kirk's daughter, who's a little bit older, um, she's four and she goes, Big Lee, it's Big Lee. Big Lee. You know, and eventually that'll become hopefully Big Lee. Um, Big Lee it was either Big that Lee or my. Well, Big, Big Lee is cute too. Yeah. Well, either that or my lordship. It had to be one of those. <laughs> Anyway, so that's 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 why it's Big Lee. I'm by the, for the record, for those of you, because I'm sitting down, I'm six two and a half, you know, and the, which is not massive by any stretch, <laughs> but there you go. All right, so um, so I meet you. So you're coming into town, and Stacy's like, I go, my dad's coming to town. I'm like, I go, dude, I want to meet your dad. So Stacy is the like, I've convinced your daughter to get up at sometimes at four thirty, sometimes at five o'clock in the morning to go on walks. Winter time, summertime, rain. And she's like, I would never do this for anyone but you because I have international clients. So I have to be online by 6 a.m. with a lot of my clients because they're overseas. And she's like, I'll get up. And we are talking about everything. I mean, like, I mean, we are full on like, co like combating, agreeing. It's loud. I mean, people are like, who are these two women that are walking this early? And they're loud. They are loud and they are fully convicted in their passions and what they're saying. So the second she said that you're coming to town, I'm like, I have to meet this person. I have to meet your dad. I can't wait to meet your dad. And the second I meet you, I'm like, oh yeah, he's like, oh, he's a spitfire. This is going to be a fun, like friend. This is going to be a fun friendship right there. And she's just like quiet. The first time I've ever seen Stacey quiet. She's just watching like, what's happening here with these two? Like what? I don't even know what to say. So I was super excited. But then I went the next week, I went to a birthday party and you were the talk of the table of John Wilder's birth, our mutual friends, the, the birthday party about Big Lee. And I'm like, I love that you walk in and there's a presence to you. Cause I, I do that too. So this is gonna be a great conversation. So, all right, so now enough about the people that we know, let's get down to you. Um, one of the biggest things I talk about about any business is in order to understand the business, we need to understand the person. We know all about the iPhone or Harper Production or Microsoft or Amazon. We know the people that are behind that. But for small businesses, our next door neighbors, we don't know about them. So I want you to take some time and talk about who is Little Lee, from Little Lee to, to, to the education Lee. Who are you? Where did you come from? What makes you who you are before the businesses start? 
Golly. Well, it all started at a small watt radio station outside of Sacramento. No, that was uh, that was Ted from uh, Mary Tyler Moore show. Um, you know, I I don't know whether you you know, our business volleyballmag.com is is, in fact, a small business, even though, you know, our readership and our coverage of the sport is international. And, th- and, and from that end, it's really cool. But it's just uh, so so I'll back. Tr- I'll start with that and then circle back for you. So it's my partner, Ed, and I he's a one of the premier volleyball photographers in the world. And he lives in San Diego and I live in Baton Rouge and together we own it. And I'm sure later you'll ask me about how that came about and I'll get to that later. But um, my, my background was in 1967, I was 13 years old and I saw the, the movie, the odd couple, which those of you who are young out there, it was about a sports writer and his buddy, who was a neat freak, and they were both getting divorced and the neat freak moved in with the sports writer who was a total slob. I am not a total slob, although my wife might disagree to some you know, degree. But anyway, so um, Oscar Madison was a sports writer. And I, I was like, that's the gig. That's it. That's what I want to do. I want to be a sports writer. So I always had that in mind. Um, I was the editor of my student newspaper in high school, Warden Melville High School in Stony Brook, New York. And then I went to uh, Syracuse for two and a half years. And um, while I was there, I majored in um, water polo, drinking and chasing girls. Going to class was not in there. And, you know, an animal house when he says, son, fat, drunk and stupid is no way to go through life. So I woke up one day. I said, I got to get get the hell out of here. I got to do something different with, you know, and someplace where I'll go to school. So ultimately, I transferred to Southern Illinois University of Carbondale and got my first. uh, uh, I I went to school there. It was like, all right, I got to go to class. I got to get this degree. And it's a wonderful place, by the way. It's a beautiful campus and uh, a great part of the world. It's about 100 miles south of St. Louis. Um, got my journalism degree, went back to New York. Kid coming out of college has like no chance getting a job at a New York newspaper then. So I ended up, my first job was in Hannibal, Missouri as a sports writer there. And from Hannibal, I went to Kansas City, where I was a sports editor of a chain of weekly papers. Um in suburban Kansas City, Missouri. Those papers folded. I got a job in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Was there for three and a half years. And then in December of 84, after interviewing previously for another job, this one was for covering the Green Bay Packers for the Green Bay Press Gazette. I was a finalist for that job, felt sure I was going to get it. Didn't get it. Had also interviewed here in Baton Rouge for the newspaper called The Morning Advocate then. Now it's now The Advocate um because they killed the afternoon paper so they don't need the morning but uh I got the job and I said well I'll come down here for a year or two well that was December 84 and uh the idea was you know build on the resume and leave but um you know one thing leads to another one ex-wife leads to another um you know uh and Baton Rouge is kind of like the Hotel California you can check out anytime you want but you can never leave so I developed a, a nice life for myself here. I mean, the job at the paper was good. Um, I was the LSU basketball beat writer the last eight or nine years I was there. Mm-hmm. I taught Shaquille how to do interviews. I inherited him as a six foot 11 freshman. You know, now he's seven two and uh, a wonderful guy, by the way, really tr- seriously, truly a wonderful person. You know, I covered basketball in like 39 states during those eight or nine years. Got, you know, covered in Hawaii, um, you know, went all over. It was great. So, uh, but in 1995, while I was still there, and I fast forward, I left the paper in 98, but in 1995, I started a television show. Of All which right, wait, I, I'm going to pause you because I want to okay. rewind. I want to rewind. Okay. All right. So you're at th- you started at 13. I want to know a little bit more in regards of, did you have family members that were in, in the media? Because, I mean, you saw this TV program, but was there someone in your family that was an entrepreneur or what did your parents, what did your family do? And if not, you're saying no, what no. did they do and what did they think of what you're doing? Oh, wow. Well, my father never um, could understand, you know, how, the, how everything that I've always done has been like, was it fun? It was kind of, you know, ch- children of the depression that drives them crazy. Right. And, uh, you know, for me, it was like, if it's not fun, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So being a sports writer was always fun. I wish I'd made a lot more money. Oh, hell, I wish I made just more money. You know, it was it was it was and the hours were tough and, you know, but it was something I always wanted to do. My mom, my father was very bright. Um my mother was an intellect. Uh, she went to start at the University of Illinois and then graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, which in 1952 was a big deal for a woman to go to a private school. Absolutely, a hundred percent. Like that, an Ivy League school. And um, she was a teacher, but she read 
um, you know, the English language for, from both of my parents was very important. Um, speak it well, write it well, understand it. And mm-hmm. so that translated to me, you know, doing, doing that side of it. Mm-hmm. But as far as a, a businessman, I mean, I mean, the only jobs I ever had as a kid until I got my first job as a sports writer was I was a lifeguard in the summers back in Stony Brook, New York. Yeah. which are, you know, six of the greatest summers of my life. It was awesome. You know, the fact that I transferred from Syracuse to Southern Illinois gave me an extra year of college, which gave me an extra year of lifeguarding, which was awesome. Um, but uh, that, and I worked in a pharmacy for uh, about six months. I mean, mm-hmm. I'd never had another kind of job other until I started the television show in 1995, which was called Sports Monday. Yeah. We just finished our 26th year. It's in the best of this summer. It's now called Sports 225, which is our area code. And uh, it's sports225.com for those of you who are really bored. But um, <laughs> so that show combined with finally towards 1998, understanding that my time in the newspaper business was, was coming to an end. I wasn't smart enough to understand what was going to happen. Um, I knew the Internet was coming, mm-hmm. but I, nobody back then understood that it was the demise of the daily newspaper per se or what was going to happen. I, I just wanted to do something different. Yeah. go in a different direction, have more control of my life. One thing that was really annoying to me was that when I left there, I was 43 yeah. and I had never been to Europe. And that really, really made me angry. And, and you know, it, well, it was well, how is that even possible. I mean, I, again, I mean, you skip, so I'm going to pause you. Well, and let, me just, and, let me just say, I've been, I've been to Europe probably 23 times. Well, no, no, no. I was going to no, but it, that wasn't the question I was like, for me, it was just like the fact that um, being a writer, um, especially for if you're covering sports, these athletes are traveling around the world. Um, English is the, you know, like your, your parents instill that in you in regards of like understanding language. I mean, I'm first generation born in America. Um, I'm dyslexic. English, I love speaking. I love reading. I mean, I love absorbing. Grammar is my nemesis on a good day. I will hire every single editor I can to make sure that my words are expressed. Um, you are now having to go to these different countries, um, remembering what your parents taught you, and articulating what's happening. So how were you able to do that? Because now you're traveling around the world, you're covering these stories, you know you have the English language down to a science. How are you able to like translate that so that way you're not losing the story in another country? Well, the one thing that you may be jumping the gun on a little bit, I was, I'm fortunate enough to have been to a lot of countries now, but that was all post sports writing era. Although okay. I, have done some, I have done some volleyball writing because of Volleyball Magazine okay. overseas, but pretty much for my, every place that I've been lucky enough to go, everybody, there's enough people who speak English. I even, you know, two summers ago, got to spend time in um, Japan and Seoul yep. and, and Korea. I mean, and, and, you know, Korea was tough. There were, English was, was not as spoken as you would think in Korea, but certainly in-, in I, I went to school there. So yes, I totally oh, okay. know that. Yeah. So Tokyo, where, where did you go to school there? So it was like, a, so it was like during my MBA program, I went to 14 countries in one year for my thesis. And so- Jeez. Yeah, it was the best year of my life. Hmm. Um, and, and so then um, there was like a, a exchange program. So it was like it was the University of Seoul. I mean, I was oh. like University of Korea. Um, and it was it was very difficult because there are individuals, I should say being first generation and learning, how, learning, knowing that I had to learn how to speak English, it's trickier in comparison to the fact that we were in China the week before and before that we were in Japan. And there was, just like you said, people... Um, go to school to learn English because they know that they can actually get more jobs that way when they're bilingual. And in Korea, they're like, no, we don't really need that as much. Yeah. Well, we, we, I played world masters water polo in Gwangju, South Korea two years ago, but that's another story too. And you know, you, you may get to that in this convoluted interview. <laughs> I don't know. So anyway, so back to, back I to speak. We I knew we were going to be jumping around every which way. I knew who I was going to be talking to today. <laughs> Yeah. Speaking, speaking the language and writing it well, which was, I think, the focus of where we were going with that. Um, it's just, you know, it's just something that was uh, ingrained in me, you know, whether it was journalism one on one at Syracuse or um, when I worked in Winston Salem. Um, there were a handful of us who worked on the sports desk there and we all took the language very seriously. And sometimes we'd have knockdown drag outs over a word in, in a headline. I mean, forget, you know, forget grammar and punctuation. You know, it'd be like, you know, just and and so it's just it's one of those things that's always been important to me. And um, to tell you, I, I could eliminate every friendship I have, probably, if I would go on Facebook or Twitter and correct people. <laughs> <laughs> because they're there, there. You're probably using all three of them wrong, just for oh, starters, yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever. I, but so when I first left the newspaper business, 
we still got the paper copy. You know, now I get it on my iPad electronically. And there were days where I would just read the paper. I get so frustrated and get out a red marker and I would just mark the whole thing up. And Brenda would say, why are you doing that? I say, it's cathartic. She goes, I'm not going to give it to anybody. She goes, you're sick. And I go, yeah, you're right. But it's just, there's that much wrong, you know, with the way this thing is edited or played yeah. out or whatever. It, it, it's, it was very important to me. And it still is, but now only within the context of my own little world. That so I don't know if that answers the question, it, but, you know. It does. Um, when I was in the media and um, people would cut and copy AP and rotors, and I'm like, do you not know? I mean, have you checked check this? And like, I go, it's AP. They're always right. When I worked for the governor, um, I was Governor Romney's press secretary. And then I go up to the media area and I meet the guy that's behind the AP, this one reporter. And I'm seeing errors, 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 errors. And I'm like, I'm so meticulous because I'm dyslexic and because I'm like, learn, I, I have to learn how to speak English. I, I can tell. I can see the error right away. And he's like, it's no big deal. We're AP. And I'm like, What? And yet every, every news outlet out there, unlike you, cut and copy, cut and copy without ever checking. So it, it does drive me crazy when you're meticulous about something. Yeah. And, then and in, defense, and in defense of these, right, in defense of the Associated Press, I think that they're meticulous in everything they do and they're quick to do corrections. And I, I, I think as a rule, by the way, Jimmy Golan, who's the Boston AP writer, who you may know, one of the AP guys started yeah. in Baton Rouge. He, he was a Baton Rouge AP guy, like ah, 35 and then, years. Yep. And, then he made, yeah. and then he made it to the top 10 market. So good for him. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. I'm here um, at market number 126 or whatever. Yeah. Are you really 126? I, oh, I have no idea. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not with a network affiliate. I don't care. You know, I got the, I got the premier volleyball publication in the world, which is like saying you're the tallest midget, but doesn't, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> All right. So let's just get there. So we're at, you're in college. You now you start working, you start developing your brand as in like a, a year standing out. Um, walk me through, um, that concept of now you know what you're doing. You're known for this. You're the writer. You, I mean, you, you're evolving in the media, um, in, in the media genre. The media is changing. It's no longer paper. Although I, I still love having the paper in my hand. I, I, I love it getting delivered. And now it's online. Um, and then you start TV. So walk me through this entire, um, the way that it's changed, like how it's evolved from the time that you started to where we are right now. Wow. Well. There's, there's a handful of things there. Um, the biggest one is that um, the biggest one right now is that it just started to rain and I have two very angry dogs I bet out in the backyard, but that's okay. They'll live. I was um, say, do you want to go get your dogs? Cause I, I don't mind. We can pause, not pause, but you can go and grab the dogs. See how hard it's raining. Yes. <laughs> pause. Okay. Go for it. There's okay. Vinny. Oh, sorry. We're recording again. There you go. Okay. <laughs> we, have, we have dry dogs. Um, so, and picking it up now. So mm -hmm. your, your question was the change in the media. Yep. There's a couple of things. So when there was a two cycle newspaper business, meaning like there were morning papers, there were afternoon papers, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much most, pretty much every afternoon paper in America was gone by around 1995. Yeah. But back in the day, you know, that was a big thing for the evening commute, you know, on trains, for example, you know, the afternoon papers, they'd get them out in time for people to read them on the way home. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there'd be the paper in the morning. Um, and then there was the evening news, which was a really big deal. Think back to your days of Walter Concrite, Concrite, Cronkite and Tom <laughs> Brokaw, it's easy yep. for me to say, you know, and, you know and Barbara Walters as well. Of course, of course. Um, not Barbara Wawa. She was still Barbara Walters back then. I know. So, but um, so you kind of had these these three news cycles, okay? And you know, like if you wrote for a morning paper and you were you were done at like let's say eleven o'clock at night, and you went to the bars, you could go to sleep at night and know that you didn't have to do anything again until the next day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Ted Turner changed all of that. In the list of human beings in the history of the world, Ted Turner is one of the top 10 most significant people in the history of the world, in my opinion. Why and is that? Why? Because he started CNN. When he started CNN, which became the first 24-hour news network, combined with CNN headline news, which back in the day used to do only news 24 hours a day. It doesn't. Now it has all sorts of weird shows on there, you know, whatever. 
Um, CNN International, there are many variances of CNN. Well, that was the start of the 24 hour news cycle. Okay. Well, then you had other people jump on board, whether it was Fox News or MSNBC and, you know, and on and on and other outlets that that changed everything. So you could see, okay, well, something happened, um, you know, in East Jackass Flats that seemed relatively insignificant, but it was showing up every hour on CNN. So mm -hmm. it grew in importance because it was just you were being bombarded with it. Now, bomb, now, now multiply that by multiple television outlets. Mm -hmm. Okay, along with the fact that the PM newspaper began to become a dinosaur. So now you had a different source. You still had the AM newspapers. You still had the evening news. You still had, of course, a radio has always been there. Yeah. You had the cable news networks. And then in the late 90s, the Internet came about mm -hmm. and it became omnipresent. And from the Internet, which is, you know, it's made the world small. It's, it's enabled us to do this, for example. You know, this is not all that much different than us sitting in the same room. The only thing oh, is we don't touch each, right. We don't touch each other when it's done. There's no high fives or hugs, yeah. you know, yeah. but it's damn close. The quality is unbelievable, right? So you've had, you, you have this occur along with social media mm -hmm. and social media. And it, it, it's all this one giant firestorm melding together at the same time, because you have the rapid progression of cell phones. Okay, so backtrack to that newspaper that I told you I started at in Hannibal, Missouri. Mm -hmm. We were owned by a company, and I can't remember the name of the newspaper company, but they decided that little newspaper in Annabelle, Missouri, would be a test place for computers. January 3rd, 1978, my first job, yep. I'm in helping inst institute a new computer system that was amazing in the newspaper business. I wasn't at the New York Times or the, or the Washington. This was the Hannibal Courier Post. And I actually was working on a computer. Now, all I could do was it was basically a visual typewriter. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the two paper, with the, the, they would still print out the long galley form of the print. It would still have to be cut and waxed and then pasted onto the page. It was poor pagination, but it was a computer. There was a room. There were eight CompuGraphic computers in there. And, you know, they had bubble screen, you know, on the keyboards and all. And it was this thing. And there was a room about the size of your basic bedroom with mm -hmm. computer banks in there, one for each computer about the size of a refrigerator. So there were these eight mass and, and you walk in there, it was hot as hell because these things were burning up, right? And it was so primitive, but it was computers. It was amazing. My iPhone, you know, right here is a billion, a billion times more um, powerful than that newspaper system. Yeah. You know, but where I'm going with that is, is that like with that iPhone, I can take video mm -hmm. that's 100 percent air capability. It's incredible. We could be doing this on iPhones. I mean, I'm doing it on a MacBook Air and you're probably doing it on a, on a, on a laptop. Desk. Oh, you're on a laptop, too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, Apple, obviously, it just changed the world. Yeah. Well, and not everybody's got an iPhone. Some people have Samsungs, but they all have unbelievable picture cap capability and unbelievable video capability. Okay, so that ties into two more things, which is social media, mm -hmm. which has changed everything in the media. People go, oh, I hate journalism. Well, have you ever posted anything on Facebook? Yeah, well, you're a journalist. You may not like that. You may not like that. Have you, you know, the woman who took the video of George Floyd being murdered got a Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. You know, yep. um, you know, an honorary Pulitzer Prize. She, didn't mean, she doesn't probably even think of herself as a journalist, but right. she is. Mm -hmm. And so all that ties into the, the strange paths in which the newspapers have gone back to the, I, I'm circling back to the question, so to speak. Yeah. You know, the New York Times had an incredible surge in subscriptions during the pandemic because people wanted to read more. And, they, and, and you know, part of that was because of the politics of the last um, presidency. You know, and 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 the pandemic and, mm -hmm. and a sense of like, wait, we need good journalism. We need it. It's just that it's changed. Well, we, we've been missing it for such a long time. And I mean, I'm going to pause you for a quick second. We I feel that journalism started going downhill when bloggers started 
because the kid that was in their basement and they're just like kind of venting out and then they were all of a sudden invited. And I mean, I, I, as a journalist, we would invite them on the show and like, and they couldn't string words together because their fingers could do it, but they could not articulate the words. Yeah. Yeah. And from that point on, everyone felt like they were a journalist and then the stories were lost. Um, and there was no, and people were like, you know what? I go, I'll just take it from anyone. And then yeah. Wikipedia oh. came into the mix too, as well. Yeah, well, one thing that was important when I was in the newspaper business, and I hope other newspaper people say the same thing about their past and about their present. We had a chain, we had a chain of command, a system that things went through. You didn't just write a story and it appeared in the paper. hundred percent. An editor edited it. Another editor saw it. Somebody else wrote the headline. You know, now at volleyballmag.com, I write a story. Yep. And, you know, most of the time they're mundane and I just check them for, you know, make sure that they're okay. And my partner, Ed, who's a real, as a photographer, yeah. as an editor, he's a really good photographer. Yeah. And I, you know, I joke with him like that, but, you know, but if it's a really big, long or important story, I make sure to get multiple sets of eyes on it. Yes. But, but that doesn't make me unique. I know sports writers now at newspapers yeah. who write their own stuff and nobody sees it before it goes online. And I've, I've got buddies in the business where I'll text them and I'll go, hey, you might want to check like paragraph three of the story you just posted because yep. X, Y, Z is wrong, you know, whatever. And retractions, oh, retractions, yeah. retractions, because that's just the same person that has a, they on their, the bottom of their email. I mean, it's on the emails of like, the bottom of the emails. So sorry for the um, misspelled words. I'm like, no, don't put that there. Just don't do misspelled words. Like, right, I mean, exactly. is, well, yeah. we're, we're living yeah. in a world where it's okay. And it's not for a lot of us that were in the media. It's not okay. Right. Yeah. So, so it's all changed. Um, and, and, and so to finish up the whole thing is that if you're, a, I have a, I have a buddy of mine covers LSU football. Mm -hmm. He refuses now after the middle of the third quarter to do social media when he's covering a football game, because a few years ago, LSU was playing Alabama, which is like the, the premier football game of the year. And he said, I was having to tweet because they were making me tweet. And he goes, I missed the biggest play of the game and screwed up my story and ended up yeah. having to go back and fix it. Yeah. You know, and I watch, I sit there and I'll watch college kids um, at a sporting event, like an LSU football game, for example, and they're all tweeting. Who the hell's reading your Everyone's tweets? Everyone's looking down. Who the hell's reading your tweets? Who's not watching the game on television? Who's yeah. not in the stadium watching the game? You know, but we, we developed this 24-hour, uh, uh, never rest, froth at the mouth, you know, media system. I'm not sure that now that I would go into it. I'm not sure under what circumstances. I had always joked that, you know, people always say, ask me when I was in the newspaper business, what would you do if you couldn't be in the newspaper business? And I always said, I'd like to be one of those videographers for Jacques Cousteau. Today, we, we explore the, 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 the scorpions underwater, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know, what I, I don't know what I would do otherwise. I mean, I've taken a lot of weird paths and have reinvented myself a few times, but mm. uh, the newspaper business right now, or the sport or the media business, if you will. In my case, it was always just sports media. Although I've done, I've, I've written real world stories before, but um, I don't know. It's a different world. I don't like, I don't like what it is for the people in it. I'm forget, forget their per people's perception yeah. of it. You know, by the way, as long as I'm on there for any of you who hear this, there is no such thing as fake news. Okay. Most of the people who write and most of the people who are on television, they're really serious about their jobs. They care deeply yeah, yeah, everybody's got some kind of agenda because everybody's got likes and prejudices. Yeah. But I think as a, as a majority, the news you get is legitimately well-researched, well, well thought out, well presented. Ooh. All right. So wait, so this is where we're going to pause because there's two things here. So number one, you really didn't answer my question. So I'm just going to call you. I don't even remember. I don't, was it before or after my dogs got well, wet? You, you went on a tangent. You went on a tangent. I'm like, I go, I'm going to let him go. Not because he's okay. Stacey's dad, because, because you went on a tangent and it was good because being a media person, I agree with a lot of different things. So I'm going to start with what you ended with. Um, in regards of the fake news, I do believe there's fake news, but I see it in the way in regards of there are a lot more individuals that are putting out news that they don't do their due diligence in researching. Well, let, let me so, stop. One, let me interrupt one second there. Uh, there, there are bad reporters, and there's there's oh, so yeah. many people who this. You know, I, I see people like I'm embarrassed for some people who what they post, for example, on Facebook, yeah. where they mm -hmm. get it from. It's like, come on, seriously, do you really think yeah. that person is a by unbiased, doesn't have an agenda, and you know, yeah. and puts this out there, and you believe that, and you believe it enough to repost it? Yeah, because exactly. That's that's what you want to hear, and then and and I'm amazed at how many people can't discern 
literal fake news, like stuff that they've been given by a Russian bot. And they're like, yep, I'm going with this and we're putting it on there. Well, I always tell people, like, I mean, my interns aren't allowed to post anything or even say anything. I'm like, I go, what are your three touch points? They're like, what am I? Do not present me anything without three touch points. Because I go, someone is going to sit there and say, like, I'm going to poke holes in your story. And it drives me crazy. We're like, they're like, but I saw it on TikTok. I'm like, I don't care where you saw it. If I don't have three real touch points, do not come near me because I will lose my mind. So be smart about that. But okay, wait, so pause. All right, so that was the, that was our conversation in regards to fake news, what we believe. Going back, I did ask you in regards of, I mean, from the time that you started your career to now, yes, it has evolved and changed, but where do you, like, how do you, where are you playing the part in it? Where, how have you evolved? And for anyone that's listening, whether you're in media or not, so I don't wanna talk about the industry because I wanna focus on you. How have you evolved in this? Because you're still a player. I, go, I, ha- I haven't. I haven't. And here's why. OK. Two days ago. And this is this goes back to when I saw you in May when I was up there mm-hmm. and I visited you in Marblehead in in May. Yeah. The day before I met you, I drove up to uh, Hollis Center, Maine. OK. And then I went north of there to in the middle of nowhere where to a trout farm. Which I. Yes. Tell me. Yes. And there's a woman named Jen Kessie and Jen Kessie and April Ross won the silver medal in beach volleyball in the London Olympics. Mm-hmm. And Jen and her husband, Andy, who's a former French pro beach volleyball player, they have moved to Hollis Center, Maine, and they run a trout farm. Mm-hmm. And I went and I spent the whole day up there with them. And finally, just this week, produced the story about Jen Kessie and her family living there. And it was mm-hmm. 6,000 words. And internet be damned, short little things be damned. We have Google Analytics. The average time that people are spending on that story, and I've, you know, modestly speaking, gotten great compliments from it because I, I think it was a hell of a good story. But of it's course- It's a good you, story. I mean, you caught my, you, I mean, I can't wait to read it because you caught my attention when you were talking about it. Well, when you get to, when you take two months to write something, you damn well better be good, right? And you have no <laughs> base limits because it's the internet. Yeah. But where I was going with that is on the Google Analytics, the average time that people are spending on that story is seven minutes and 10 seconds. Yeah. OK, people still want qualities. Well, everybody, want, I hope, wants good journalism and, and yeah. things that matter. They want you know to hold the, 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 the mayor, the, the, the city commissioners, the police chief, and still want mm-hmm. them to hold their feet to the fire. You still want to ask tough questions to the coaches. Yep. But they, people still want to read good, well-written, interesting stories. And like mm-hmm. that particular story, I hope, met all those categories. The point being is that, yeah, I mean... Yesterday, I had to write something about a news event. It took me 15 minutes. It was like 300 words, and it got a ton of page clicks. But it didn't require anything other than basic journalism skills. This was you know, a piece of, piece of art. <laughs> but seven minutes and 10 seconds is where I was going with that. People yeah. will take the time to still read good quality stuff. And they don't all have yeah. to be old. They just yeah. still read it because if it's good. you know. Well, and so, like, so the answer so, to your question is, so sorry. I, I've – Sure, I've adapted because we run a website. A website's different than a newspaper. You know, you have yep. to be fluid. Uh, sometimes, you know, I, I have to be aware of social media. I, I handle Facebook and Twitter. Ed yep. handles Instagram. The whole Instagram thing to me is just like uh, picture porn for people. Oh, let me show you pictures. I love of it. Instagram. I love it. You know, Insta- but but Instagram is 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 there. So Ed Ed's more in tune with Instagram. So you yep. have to do all those things for an old guy. You know, that's but but I get how that all that works. The other side of it, though, is news judgment is news judgment. Um, standards are standards. Good writing. Back to what we said earlier, knowing the English language, writing it well, yeah. making it coherent, you know, tightening it up, making it good. Those are all part of part of the game. So the answer to your question is, sure, I've changed a little bit because you're a dinosaur if you don't and you yeah. don't recognize all the stuff. But no, when it comes to writing, I ho- I'd like to think I'm a better writer of the long stuff than, you know, than I was 30 years ago. But who knows, you know. My favorite um, pieces of, I mean, I, I call it my, my, my go-to guilty pleasures, Rolling Stones, Vanity Fair, Economist, Wall Street Journal, long form. I started in the media all about long form conversation. This is why I started the podcast where I'm not giving you 15 minutes. I'm giving you 45 minutes to an hour to talk, to understand sure. who you are. Because yeah. that, that, those little snippets give me nothing. They give me nothing at all. And for those of you still watching this from the beginning, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So March 2020, uh, March 2020, there's, I mean, February, there's the buzz. buzz oh, listen, like March, tw- March 2020, 
I went. No, stop it. No, don't interrupt me. Wait, no. I, wait. I flew up to Marblehead. <laughs> that was my last thing. I went to go see the kids and I spent three, four days up in Marblehead. And on the way home, there was like nobody in the airport. My plane was empty. And I was thinking to myself, I'm really pushing the envelope here. But I got home and unscathed. So you're here. You go back home. It's 20, the buzz, the world shuts down. Not, not just the country, the world shuts down. What happens to you? What happens to you, your industry? What's going on in your mind? And now full 15 months-ish, um, yeah. where are you now in comparison to where you were 15 months ago? This is the damnedest thing. So the volleyball world shut down. There was, you know, we were in the middle of the men's indoor NCAA season, the women's beach NCAA season. Both of those shut down. Uh, the pro beach volleyball scenes shut down. The Olympics were postponed a year. We began a time where we had more page views and more interest in what we wrote in those 15, 16 months since that we've ever had. We were on track. We, we the first year, we bought the magazine in two, right before the 2016 Olympics. For 2017, I think we had 950,000 page views. This year, we're on track for 2 million. I don't know why, except that all I can tell you is that people missed the sport. They were starved for the content. And we were super creative. Yeah. But let me tell you the most important thing about the pandemic when we started. So I got home from that trip in March. Yeah. And I had this idea in my house. And of course, if I, you know, I could take the computer now and show you, but I won't. But we have this really nice little front patio. Not a yeah. porch. You just go outside. And it's a nice patio with you know, plants and flowers and chairs. I had these two small brick walls, about two and a half feet high, yay wide, built on each side of that patio. There's a little corner over on the one side and there's another there. And they're beautiful. And you know, I'm not big on material possessions per se, but these made me so happy to look at. But they <laughs> doubled with a couple of chairs that we had for the ability for like seven or eight people yep. to come over and sit spaced out so it'd be like three people out on the lawn on the chairs and a couple people on each brick wall and us on our chairs. And we tailgated every day because nobody was going to work. Everybody was nice. so around 4.30, the gang would meet outside our house. And it was still nice because, you know, here in Louisiana, March, April, are fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, the weather's good. And we would have, you know, everybody drink three or four cocktails or beers or whatever. And then at six o'clock, I'd go, all right, everybody go home. So everybody, and I, and I, in my house, I, I do the shopping and the cooking and I love to cook. Good looking. And I can cook, Jody. So, oh, geez, the modesty here is just killing me, Lee. The yes. modesty. Jeez. There you go. So there you go. So <laughs> anyway, we're doing that. You know, this is every day. This isn't like, you know, two days a week. This is every day, right? And I remember saying to Brenda, I said, you know, I love those brick walls. They're, they make me so happy. And I said, I love us visiting with our friends. And I said, we, we got to freaking slow down here. We cannot keep drinking and eating at this pace. This is this is nuts. That, I mean, would, be everybody, that would be everybody with the whole entire gaming of the pandemic right. 20. Right, right. So, you know, then it was like, all right, well, let's. Uh, so, you know, I made it a personal challenge to try to cook something cool and different all the time. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I only went to two places, you know, walking a dog or going to the grocery store for the longest time. And then luckily here, May 17th, our YMCA mm -hmm. opened on a limited basis out indoors. And then we have an outdoor pool. We swim outdoors here year round yeah. and I swim and play water polo. So I wanted to, so I was able to actually start swimming six days a week and have, yeah. and have ever since. So that's the short term, but I, I love my, I, I thought, you know, the, so from, from, from the business sense of volleyballmag.com it's like, Ed and I, you know, was like, all right, well, what are we going to do here? You know, I, you know, we have to come up with some kind of plan. Well, we have freelancers and everything, and I got everybody involved. And we just tried to generate as many stories as we could related to the volleyball slash the pandemic, keeping up with everybody and just trying to generate, you know, our goal was to make sure we had at least one good story a day, five days a week. We weren't okay. even worried about seven. I mean, a lot of weeks we'll have 25 stories, 20, 25 stories. Mm -hmm. But during the time when there was nothing, it was like, all right, let, let's come up with ideas. And everybody did, luckily. Mm -hmm. And so from our sense, from a page click aspect, which is, you know, life is all about page clicks for us. Unfortunately, yeah. 
It was great. It was really good. We've done, we did really well. Well, then in the volleyball world, the NCAA had a limited season in the fall. So, you know, we covered it and then it had a full season mostly in the spring and through the summer. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of anticipation now because of the Olympics, which are just two weeks out, yep. you know, Ed, Ed is going as a matter of fact to, to Tokyo. I think he's out of I his see. mind, but um, it was just because, I mean, you've been to Tokyo. Well, it's not easy. Tokyo it's not navigating. I go, it's, uh, yes, I've been, I love it. Um, during the, I mean, I was in, in, I was in Beijing the week before the last, the, their Olympics, which was amazing yeah. in every single way. But right now during a pandemic, I have no problem traveling overseas. I do have a problem going to a place where there's all these people coming in from all over the world, knowing that there's a lot of countries that are still closed down. Yeah, no, um, you could, we could debate the whole Olympic things for forever. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll have, uh, two televisions, a laptop, and an iPad going at all times because I'll be watching um, women's indoor, men's indoor, yep. women's beach, men's beach. Yep. You know, we have, uh, you know, the United States has uh, two beach teams in each of each gender yep. and then an indoor team in it for the men and for the women. So, you know, for me, it's every single day there'll be something. Yep. And of course, I like to watch other things as well. It's not just the volleyball. I mean, there's a lot about the Olympics that I, I like. No, but I, I love I love everything about the Olympics. The safety part of it is concerning, but I love everything. It brings the world together. And for me, that's yeah. very, very important. Yeah. And I, and I hope that we don't say, you know, six weeks from now, oh, nice super spreader event they had there in Tokyo. You know, of course, there are no fans allowed. And um, at least they act, they had the good sense to acquiesce on um, breastfeeding women. Who are competing to let them bring their babies. I honestly couldn't even believe that that was even a, a conversation. No, we had, that they we had it happen in a volleyball tournament in Colorado yeah. uh, a couple months ago. It's, if you, it was it's just insane, insane. Yeah, of course, of course. Anyway, so um, I don't know. Did I answer the, the 15 month question? I kind of did, I think. You know, um, we you did. You along. You know, I didn't at, go. At the, end, at the end of the day, I feel like you're just talking and I'm just going to like pull you back uh, when I need to. Reel me back. So, <laughs> Um, you know, I went to volleyball. The first volleyball match of the NCAA season last September was in Lafayette, yeah. Louisiana, University of Louisiana at Lafayette, which is in yeah. the Sunbelt Conference, played a team called Houston Baptist, which is in the Southland. And they came to Lafayette, which is an hour away. Mm -hmm. And so I went and covered that first weekend. It was, you know, but How it was. How was it? Like, so you're well, going in. So th at, this, at this point, you're like, you're in your backyard. You're taking yeah. your dogs for a walk. You're now going to an event. How was it? How did you feel that they covered that? Um, covered the. Well, they, they only let in the parents of the kids. Yep. There were no fans per se. You know, we, we all had to stay away from each other and you mm -hmm. know, nobody had vaccines then. We were wearing masks and yep. whatever. And, uh, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you know, just trying to be respectful of the parameters and, and, and the, the boundaries. But it was good to see. You know, and the volleyball people were excited to see me. They were glad that I showed the interest. And then I went to, uh, I flew to Oklahoma, yeah. to uh, Texas, in, in the first big match of the year, Texas played at Oklahoma. Okay. Um, and uh, I had never been to Norman before. I mm -hmm. also went to the Oklahoma City Memorial, because yeah. I flew into Oklahoma City and stayed there and then went there in the morning. That was, that's, that's a really good memorial and very scary. Yeah, I I, I know. I definitely. That's one of the things where I mean, on the bucket list of places I want to go. That's one of the things I definitely want to see. But again, that's a that's a we we can go right, on right. tangents, Lee. We can go or oh, no, focus. No, but, but I went to I went to that volleyball match there, and then one other time, two other matches I went to. I drove to Austin, yep. where Texas played Baylor. That was a big deal. But I stayed with a friend there, and um, things hadn't loosened up at all. But you know, they invited me in, and then uh, I saw one other match where I went over to Alabama and saw a match. But that was it. I didn't go to any any other volleyball. Um, the first big tournament that we went to was uh, about six weeks or so ago in New Orleans was uh, a second tier AVP, which is uh, the pro tour for beach volleyball, but in New mm -hmm. Orleans. But because there are no other big tournaments, a lot of big names came there. Okay. So we were there. But, uh, you know, I'm vaccinated. Ed's vaccinated. Um, I live in a third world country in Louisiana, so people don't care. So, um, you know, <laughs> so we're all as... You know, you just do the best you can do. I mean, I still, even though I'm vaccinated, I'm careful in public places. And personally, that's just how I want to be. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was nice to have a tournament. Nice to have some semblance of normalcy for all that. Uh, biggest thing in the news right now, um, other than the Olympics, are the fact that the NCAA are allowing these students to promote themselves for the first time ever. What do you see? How do you see that being played out? Because you've covered these students all along. 
Um, a lot of rock stars, a lot of not so much rock stars. You covered basketball. You saw the rock stars. You mentioned Shaquille. Um, so what do you believe? I mean, how do you, like, what's your perception of what happens now for these students? Because a lot of them are like, it's cash blunt. I'm going to make a lot of money. A lot of these kids, 99.9% of these kids are peaking in college and they, they go off and they're just kind of like, I don't know, working in like at their mom and dad's shopping or whatever's or some financial career. So what do you think this does for these students right now? Well, for starters, it's anarchy. And I'll tell you why. It's anarchy on a couple of fronts. Before we get to the NIL, which is name, image, and likeness, there's free agency. Okay, basically now kids can transfer. And this particular year, there's more transferring than ever. And here's why. Yeah. Because last year, a majority of the athletes were given a free year. The NCAA said, well, you, we've just got to give you a free year. So you've got kids coming back for their sixth years. Yep. Because, you know, so not only just their fifth years, you know, you've got in the past, you had five years to play four. Well, now you have six years to play five. Mm -hmm. um, there's some, you know, uh, and some are here longer than that because of other reasons, whether it was medical red shirts or extenuating circumstances, you know, like uh, John Belushi in Animal House. College, the best eight years of my life. So <laughs> you've got an interesting situation of, kids graduating and then going somewhere else as a graduate student in our sport volleyball it's it's crazy in december there were 1200 kids in the transfer portal in division one okay um the it, the number of kids who were leaving to go in volleyball one of the things is they play four years and they transfer for a year to go play beach volleyball if they're good enough and that's but it's happening everywhere it's happening in football in basketball every sport Coaches have said this to me word for word. I can't worry about my program anymore. I have to build a team each year. And that's very unfortunate. So you've got the chaos of free agency, which is running rampant more than other. The SEC, for example, has said it's okay to transfer from school to school within the league without a penalty. Okay. Meaning like it used to be you transfer and you sit out a year. You've got that. Then you've got the NIL. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, the NCAA is for the first time allowing student athletes, I call them athlete students, to be able to make money off of themselves, if you will. Name, image, and likeness, the NIL. There's a gymnast at LSU, a kid from New Jersey who just finished her freshman year. Mm -hmm. um, she has a combined social media following of something like 1.1 million. It's estimate, you know, she's like a TikTok phenom, you know, whatever. And plus she has Instagram. She's got whatever. They estimate she'll make low seven figures next year as a sophomore at LSU. Why, well, you know, and yeah, in our sport, there are the Nebraska coach told me specifically about one of his players who's returning. Mm -hmm. She had to decide if she would make more money coming back for another year at Nebraska, or if she turned pro, she came back because of what she thinks she could do on, you know, social media endorsements. Yeah. Me personally, I want volleyballmag.com to find a kid at a really poor school who's disadvantaged and not on scholarship. Yeah. And I want to be able to give her like a hundred dollars a month to play for playing volleyball for doing something really silly. Like she has to go like this or something at the introductions, you know, <laughs> because you know why not right you know we'll help out a kid but it, 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 it helps out the but, kids I go but I, mean, I was gonna say it helps out the kids I go but as a marketing person my biggest fear for a lot of these kids are people are trying to I mean sponsors are rushing to them and they're the like well, signing and they don't the know rich, how to do the rich are going to get richer for starters mm -hmm. okay the, the the power five conferences which you know are um, the SEC, the ACC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, and the Pac-12. Those are the big schools, plus a few others. Throw Notre Dame in there, you yeah. know, whatever. And the kids at those schools, those programs, I mean, they're all advertising. Hey, we're equipped to help you with the NIL. Look at what we can do, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on one hand, sure, kids ought to be able to make it. There, there's nothing that you, can, you can't say, oh, no, this is bad for them. Yeah. You know, it's good for the kids. Now, it will take focus off of uh, the team because – Mm -hmm. You don't develop strong social media and justify all that money without working hard at it. Right. You know, they're just not going to throw you the bones because, you know, you, it, I assume it's hard to make a high quality 30 second TikTok. It probably requires some thought and some editing. 
It really least. doesn't. It really, I mean, oh, these, oh. these kids are, these kids are very savvy, but you're yep. right in regards of, I go, I'm not following you if you can't play the game or if you can't do it. I mean, I'm following you because you're the athlete. I go, right. and so once you become so popular and you're making the money, are you taking, are you as focused right. as the sport? Well, the, in the NBA, for example, you know, the joke is, you know, the coach rolls out the ball, you know, and the, I've been to NBA practices. They don't even listen to the coach. They don't care. You know, they do what they want to do. The players, the, the inmates run the asylum, for lack of a better term, the tail. Oh, no, that, 100% on that. That's, that's why we enjoy college games. Well, but isn't that going to happen in college? Yeah. I'm, I'm Joe Smith playing for State U, and my coach makes a million, and so do I. Yeah. And, he, and I'm on scholarship, and if, I, if he doesn't win, he loses his job, but I still get to keep my scholarship. Yeah, which is there's 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 so much good that can happen from it for the kids. Mm-hmm. You know, the businesses can capitalize on it, in a, you know, hopefully in a positive way. But we all know that it's yeah, a flaw. Bad bad things are going to happen from it. There will be casualties, and there'll be damages in the wake of all this. Yeah. But yeah. it always was maddening that like um like take Shaquille O'Neal when he was at LSU, yeah. his father. The late Sarge Harrison used to drive seven hours from San Antonio to LSU to watch games. And, and kids were wearing, you know, Shaq jerseys all over campus. And But if he tried to even sign an autograph and get paid for it or sell a Shaq jersey, he couldn't make a penny. Right. You know, they, LSU had the, the quarterback named Joe Burrow, um, mm-hmm. you know, won the Heisman Trophy, big time, you know, football player now with the Cincinnati Bengals. He'd have made $5 million a year, probably in endorsements, but you know, other things that are going to happen from it is, and you remember the fab five at Michigan. Oh yeah, absolutely. Of course. Well, they were smart. They all banded together and they all said, let's go to Michigan together and let's win. Well, that hasn't happened yet, but it will. Yeah. You know, you may have a kid, you know, like little Susie would really like her four teammates to come and little Susie's daddy owns a car dealership. And he tells the four, the four kids, look, if you guys all come to state you with me and my daughter, yeah. I'll give you guys all use of a, a car for four years. Yeah. You know, in a lease situation, what's that worth? 50 grand? I don't know. You know, whatever. And yeah. it's not illegal. It's all part of the equation. All that, all that's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet because the kids, everybody's looking out for themselves, but eventually some of them will figure it out. Well, it's very much like um the, what, with friends where I go, the cast members of friends were like, um, you're, you can't give one person a, a high raise. We all come in as a package. And so, and then other shows start doing the same exact thing. So they, yes, there are going to be some casualties. There are going to be a lot of people that are very savvy to what's happening. Um, it'll be very interesting, but I wanted to get your perspective on that. Um, during the pandemic, how, I mean, what did you get? I mean, what did you add to your life and to your career that you would have never done if you didn't have the time? Wow. Well, I became more Zoom savvy. <laughs> you know, I do a sports television show, which I think you and I talked about before we started recording. It's mm-hmm. called Sports 225 here in Baton Rouge. Well, maybe we talked about it, I don't know. But um, we couldn't go to studio. Yeah. And luckily, I have video editing skills. It's something I've learned along the way and I really enjoy. Now it's just basic stuff. But I'm able to do these Zooms mm-hmm. and I record the multi- uh, the gallery view and the speaker view both yeah. and alternate between them as I want to, as it goes. And, you know, ultimately I don't have any professional lighting in here. I'm just sitting in my office, in my house, but you know, I've got a light there. I've got a light there. I've got yeah. the wind, you know, the natural lighting. And I think I sound okay. Probably to you, right? Sound good. You sound know? good. Yeah. And the you other thing, vo- that, you have a boisterous the, voice. That's why. There you go. Well, <laughs> but the, the other part of it is, um, I think people watch network now and they go, you know, heck mine's a local show. We're on also on a Cox sports network, which is regional in like 18 States. Yep. So if you're ever in Missouri in the middle of the night, you can watch sports two two five if you're bored. But anyway, so, <laughs> but, um, uh, um, where I was going. Oh, so I don't think people get upset about the quality of the production anymore. I don't. You know, I do a zoom I do Zoom. It's okay. I'm never going back to studio. And the reason I'm never going back to studio. So here, here here's another answer. It used to be, you know, we'd shoot it at Wednesday mornings at 11, for example, you know, mm-hmm. and the person would have to come in you know, join me in studio. You'd have to wear pants and everything. I'm not now I'm wearing shorts. Um, but now if I want to get, um, you know, my friend, Steve Berkowitz at USA Today, who lives in Virginia, if I want to get, um, 
you know, uh, uh, somebody else. That, uh, I get guests now, even from Baton Rouge, for yeah. 10 minutes a piece who don't have to leave the comfort of their own home or their office to come on my TV show. So it's, right. it's greatly enhanced. And so it, that part's way better. We, we started doing more Zooms for VolleyballMag.com, more, mm -hmm. more video interviews, because everybody's so, it's not a big deal to click on it. To get, it used to be a big deal when you go, okay, all right, I'm going to set you up and we're going to Skype. And we're just like, oh. now it's second nature. Right. Volleyball coaches will tell you they live on Zoom. Yeah. You know, so to do give me five minutes for something or whatever, it's no big deal. So that's uh, something you added that's on. A, that's a big thing. Um, the other thing was probably we had to plan more. We had to actually talk. Wait, you had a what war? Plan. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's like, all right, there's no volleyball or there's going to be volleyball. Let's talk about how we're going to approach X, Y, Z, and let's make sure we cover this and cover that. So, we probably, you know, but, but otherwise, no, we just didn't get to go to volleyball matches. You know, I went uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I went to Orlando to the AAU National Volleyball Tournament, Girls Club, biggest tournament in the country. And I saw Fran Flory, the LSU coach, and Vanessa Hackett Jacobs from Southern University, two schools here in Baton Rouge. I saw them in person for the first time in 15 months. We both live, we live like a couple miles from each other. Just didn't ever see them. I didn't you, go to yeah, you, were leaving, you were leaving a house. Right. And, I, and their matches, you know, well, Southern didn't have any and practically. And LSU's were, it was so limited. It was like, I can watch it on TV and do better. But my point is, is that that was like, you know, Coaches and I shaking hands, hugging each other. It was like, this is, you know, almost like old times. So, you know, it's, uh, but, but um, I, I don't know. I think, you know, it's, again, goes back to, you know, writing's writing, covering volleyball's covering volleyball. We just didn't get to go to the volleyball, you know? Uh, I have two more questions for you. Um, sure. In regards to anyone. So there's a lot of individuals that um, either got furloughed, lost their jobs, graduated from school, couldn't get that job, got their jobs pulled away from, from them, or they have a job they're getting paid and they hate it. At the age of 15 years old, you saw something on TV that piqued your interest and you kept on going with it. Um, you have now become, you've become this machine of being an entrepreneur. You've created ways to stay in the field. You, you ha you're in your industry, but you've created ways to stay in your field. What advice would you give to anybody that's thinking about doing something on their own, they don't know where to start, or they're working for a company, they're like, you know what? I have depended on this company for quite some time. I'm no longer feeling it anymore. I want to pull the aspect of what I do for this company and create, create my own thing. What advice would you give them in regards to the highs and the lows of doing something like that? And now a message from our sponsor. Since 2017, the Foundation for Business Equity has existed to support Black and Latinx-led companies in reaching their full potential by providing access to critical growth tools that include expanded networks, capital, and markets. To learn more about the Foundation for Business Equity, FBE, visit fbequity.org. And now, back to our guest. Wow. Well, when I left, so when I, when I worked for the Daily Newspaper here in Baton Rouge, you know, I had a steady paycheck. I didn't make a lot of money, but I could live comfortably. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had the fun of covering all the sports that I covered and everything. But like I said, that had run its course. I, I owned the television show, which I started at the same time. But everything else was kind of like a, uh, a no man's land. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to my wife, I said, look, I want to get my life back. There's a lot of stuff I want to do. And I said, I think that I can market myself in a number of ways, not the least, which was freelance writing, which, you know, I, I did cultivated a, a lot of that after I left, but I said, we may be poor. I said, if I leave and I, I, you know, she's, she's a teacher and has a great job. And I said, and I know we can live off of what you make, but I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and she was like, I'm okay with that, which I always appreciated, you know, but it was the only answer really she could give. She couldn't say, no, stay in the job. You can't leave, you know? No, but I mean, it, it had just run its course and I was miserable because it was time. So I was lucky. I mean, there were some years I left in 98. Um, there were a couple of years in there where I made gobs of money and it was awesome. There were some years in there we just didn't make a bunch, you know, it was like, all right, well, we can't buy X, Y, Z this year because but we, we never didn't have enough beers or food on the table, you know? So, and got, you know, so, but uh, it's all balanced out. 
to your point, I've reinvented myself twice. I left the newspaper business. I was 43 years old. As I mentioned previously, you know, I had 43 and never been to Europe. You know, now I've been, you know, all these times and luckily. Then I reinvented myself five years ago when Ed Chan and I bought Volleyball Magazine, Mm -hmm. you know, which was a print publication with a limited website, you know, and um, that's a whole other story for another day about how we bought it and everything and whatever. He called me and said, we can buy Volleyball Magazine. You want to buy it? And I said, yes. That was a whole conversation. I never asked how much it cost or anything. And, you know, and we did. You, you know, there's, there's you, you, if you leave, like if you work for the man and you've got that paycheck and you've got all the benefits that go with it, mm-hmm. nobody's stupid enough to understand that, okay, if I leave, I don't have those benefits and I don't have the money. And usually it's the benefits that are more important because of today's world, you know, the health, health insurance is nothing is par- more paramount than that in your life. You know, you, you have one day where you let your health plan lapse and you have something bad happen to you on that day. Well, yeah, it's like winning the lottery. Okay. But in reverse, you yeah. know, your life could be ruined financially, mm-hmm. you know, forget all the other stupid things you could do. So those are, those are things that you just have to consider. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the, the old, they say, well, make sure you have three months in the bank to live in case you, you know, lose your job, whatever. Well, yeah. probably if you, have a plan and you're not hundred percent sure what it is, maybe you better have six months out there. And, and one of the things too, when I left at 43 was that I remember specifically saying, I've got to take a chance to do what I want to do now because I'm young enough to get out and maybe still get back in, you know, at 43, you can still get another job. Yeah. It may not be newspaper job, you know, it may, it, but, but there was something that I could do mm-hmm. now at the point where I am, um, you know, what would I have value in the corporate world? You know, luckily I own all my own entities. I own my television show. I put on a couple of volleyball tournaments and then Ed and I own the magazine, yeah. you know? So luckily I'm able to control my own destiny and do what I want to do, but not everybody has that fortunate situation. So, you know, the biggest advice is, yeah, don't be afraid. You can reinvent yourself multiple times. I mean, think how many people there are who went to college for a degree in this, but work in that. Yeah. yeah. Most people, most people don't have a path. They're just like, learn as much as you can. That's which is something I tell younger people going to college. Don't worry about picking your, your major, just learn. You know, the only, the big, I, I was a terrible student. I had terrible grades. You know, my freshman year at Syracuse, I had a, um, a three, two average. That's a one, five plus a one, seven. And that's not a joke. That's actually what my grade point averages were. They let me come back. I don't know what the hell's wrong with them. They wanted the money, I guess. I don't know. But my, my only regret in, in academics as a high school and then college student, because I never, certainly never went back to class ever again, except for an adult Italian class I took once, was I wish I'd learned more because I like learning. You know, learning's fun. And I like and I like knowing things, you know, and I wish that I had, had done more of that. I never cared about the grades and still don't, you know, whatever. But um, so if you, if you were to be thinking about making some kind of career change, obviously, A, have a plan, have something that you have a passion for. You know, the other corny line that I give to people is like, you know, this, the day is basically broken up into three segments and they're eight hours each. You know, you have eight hours of work, give or take, and most people work more. Yeah. You have eight hours of sleep time and most people s- sleep a little less. And then you've got those other eight hours. And it's those other eight hours that determine whether you have a good life or not. Even if you hate your job, you damn well better have a comfortable bed and get a good night's sleep. But it's those other eight hours, you know, that determine the quality of your life. You know, who your friends are, what your activities and all those things are. So those things all need to be intact in, in as well. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the thing that we talked about being the bane of the newspaper existence, for example, the Internet. Well, the Internet and all the good things that come with it allow lots of new jobs and new opportunities for people. I mean, all these people say, I'm going to start a cupcake company, you know, and they can ship cupcakes because they can do it through the Internet. Yeah. You know, I wrote a story about a former volleyball player from uh, Oregon. She was a pro player. Um, she has a company called the Slumberkins, S-L-U-M-B-E-R-K-I-N-S. And it's these dolls for kids. And they have these little books that go with them. She grossed something like 8 million this year in Slumberkins. And she started, I never even heard of Etsy until I interviewed her and did this story. Etsy is a place to market things. I Who, who knew? And she's in negotiation. You're, you're so cute that you've never heard about Etsy, dude. Seriously. <laughs> and now she's in mark. She's in negotiations to have the Slumberkins be part of the next Jim Henson Company project. 
Nice. You know, that's right. You know, that's Muppet stuff. I mean, you know, and she's she was just a school teacher. Another mom who was a school teacher was a basketball player. Yeah. And they and their families and their kids and they started Slumberkins knitting them themselves. You know, it's at volleyballmag.com in case you're bored. But anyway, so but but, you know, I love but, your hard sell here. Really? Like, I go no, but would that could that have happened without the Internet? Yeah. Of course not. You know, because they weren't good. What did she sell? Ten Slumberkins in the local craft store. You know, now she's, you know, Etsy, you know, and, and um, you know, we we use social media for volleyballmag.com and we've got 40,000 plus Twitter followers. You know, we're, we've got, I don't know, I want to say 25,000 on Instagram and another 25 on Facebook. So whenever we write a story, we hit all those. Plus we hit forums and stuff. And that's how we generate, you know, because we don't have the print anymore. It's just all volleyballmag.com. So but, I mean, with, with, with everything that you're saying, which is, which is what I love is like, not only have you um, continue to redevelop yourself, I mean, like it, there's, there's always another version of Lee where you're the share of what you're doing. Share is always rediscovering yourself, Madonna of the industry. Um, what, what people are pulling out of you is the fact that one, you're rediscovering yourself, you're learning new things, you're using all the new technologies um, and you're not staying stagnant, which is huge. I think that a lot of people um, where, they, where if they had started where you are, they just get to the point where they're frustrated with all the technologies. They're frustrated with all the news. They want it to be the way it was and you're not stopping. Oh no, I, I, I'm fascinated by all that. Although as of today, I've stopped learning. Uh, as soon as we're done, I'm gonna pop a beer and <laughs> take a nap. But uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if I, you know we, Ed and I both embrace all the stuff that, that we're talking about that goes along with, uh, our publication and, you know, the social media and all the things, that, you know, the way that he and I, for example, were talking about a different way that he can go to Tokyo and transmit mm -hmm. pictures to me and get them into his phone, for example, yeah, you know, and, and get them to me instead of waiting to have to use his computer. So we're always, you know, we're always talking and thinking about things like that. But, um, uh, you know, your, your point is well taken that, you know, my mom who died a few years back was in her 80s. And she had a laptop and she used to Skype with my kids. You know, it's just, you know, it's incredible. You I know, we have, it. yeah, we have um, at the YMCA where I swim, you have to reserve your lane 24 hours in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's an app for that, you know, and there's a, there's a man who swims with us. His name is Gerard. He's 93. Gerard swims 2,100 miles a day, by the way, which is over a mile and a half, about a mile and a third. And Gerard, you know, reserves his own lane every day, you know. So, you know. All right. So, so I, I, I did say I had two more questions, but I, I do have. Sure. Before the last, last question, I have one more. Okay. Big Lee, you have how many kids? Two kids. Stacy Ferris and her husband, Graham, and their two children, mm -hmm. um, Sydney and Gavin, and they live in uh, Marblehead, Massachusetts, yeah. and Kirk Feinstwag. And his wife, Lindsay, who, as we speak, is moments away from having kid number three, a yeah. boy named Mac. And they're calling it M-A-C-K. And I want to know why there's a K in there. But they oh, also Mac, have Mac, Mac truck. That's what I was thinking. And then, they, you know, four year old Lila, who, as you, you've met Lila, she's a piece of work. And one and a half year old Rex. And so it's hard to imagine somebody this young could be a grandfather to begin with so much as it's going to be five times over. But well, uh, they live. Well, well, in, well, that, no, wait, 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 wait. Do you have? Do you only have two kids, right? Two kids. All right. Yeah, so I, I, I didn't. I didn't know. So with you have two kids. They live in the Northeast. You're in the, the South. Um, you're married. You have the two dogs. You have a business. Two cats. How? What? Two cats too. Oh, two cats. No, I'm a dog person. I'm not going to talk to you. But I've I mean, got one dog and two cats in here, and I don't know where the other dog. He left. He, he's not. He's not in here. With all of this, especially in like, and your wife at home, you're like, so you're, you're in your, each other's space. How did you balance sanity with everyone? I mean, you're worried about, I mean, as a parent, you worry and you're thinking about your children. You're not able to get to them as easily as you usually would be. Your wife, your daughter, like with everything, how were you able to balance and keep sane during this time, not knowing what was going to happen, especially to a few of your businesses? The first thing is, and I say this not even jokingly because my kids will back me up, is I'm really selfish and self-centered. So I worry, <laughs> you know, it's like, and Stacy and Kirk and their mother and I were divorced when they were fairly young. Mm -hmm. And so there's always been this uh, separation, whether it's geographical or time-wise. 
And so we always learned to make the most out of the times we had together, mm -hmm. but them being fully independent from a fairly young age. You know, I mean, I remember one time uh, Kirk, when he was like six or seven, flew from Baton Rouge to New York to go see mm -hmm. relatives by himself. Now, Kirk is 39, so that would have been 33 years ago. And as we all know, it's a different time. Yeah. But I remember, uh, you know, he, he flew and then a couple hours later, you know, I have a collect call from Kirk. And those of you who don't know what that is, that's when people used to actually call and reverse the charges and he used to accept <laughs> collect calls. We were talking about this the other day. What's a collect call? <laughs> I have a collect call from Kirk. We accept. I go, sure. Hello. I go, what's happening? He goes, well, we're in Pittsburgh. I go, okay, well, you, you know, you connecting flight. He goes, now nah, we got a long delay. They told me it would be a couple hours. I said, okay, you, you know where you are? And he goes, yep. I go, you got your money? Yep. You got your uh, snacks? Yep. Okay. Well, call me back, you know, later when you want, and, you know, stay in that area. Okay. Okay. Never thought twice about it. I didn't worry. You know, the kid was, kid flown, he'd flown. He was six, seven years old. He knew what to do. Now, <laughs> Stacy, you think Stacy will let her 12 year old daughter fly by herself? No. You know, so, Stacey, I know you're eventually getting to see this because you're curious. You say, yeah. I was like, wait, but you flew at six or seven. You know, you had it. The rule was you had to eat your Cheerios one at a time. <laughs> you take gobs of them. You know, you had to eat one at a time. That way they would last longer. Lee, focus. Anyway. How did you handle the balance? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, so, you know, like any parent, you're concerned about your kids. You want them to do well. You're always, you know, you're always thinking about them and theirs. But you're not there. You, you know, you, you just have to just do the best you can do. You know, we, we talk a lot. You know, if there's something comes up, you know, like um, Stacy and I talk all the time. Stacy's always got something going on, you know. Um, and when I'm there, I'll be up there again uh, in a month. I, you know, mark your calendar, you know, come, come hang out for a few days. But when I do, you know, we maximize the time together. That's all you can do, you know. And um, here but again, you know, like, how did you balance yourself during this time? I mean, yeah, so there's oh, the kids, oh, no, but then no, there's my, everything no. else. Oh, remember I told you our YMCA opened uh, May 17th, 2020? Yeah. Mm -hmm. six, six days a week, nine o'clock, every day, swim 3,000 yards a day. Today, I only did 2,600, but that's because we did a bunch of sprints. Okay. I'm really hurting right now. I'm just not showing it. I'm, <laughs> uh, I might go on to life support when we're done. I have so many body parts <laughs> that are hurting right now. We did a killer workout. Every single day, early on in the pandemic, before the pool opened, the dogs were like, really, we have to walk again, you know, um, especially, you know, so, but, uh, you know, everybody, you know, the joke was the dogs are like so happy we get to go for walks and we're here all the time. And the cats are like, when are those people going back to work? Why are they here? So, you know, um, waking up every morning, being true to volleyballmag.com, writing stuff, writing, writing is, is a good outlet for me, both professionally and personally, it makes me feel good. Um, so there was always that working out really hard every day, swimming 3000 yards. That's 1.7 miles um, every day, six days a week. I took Sunday, take Sunday off because a, the pool was closed and B, I had to have a recovery day. Yep. So that's you know, the physicality part of that is super important. I think to the mental, emotional, psychological part of dealing with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. The other was, is that our world became very small. Yep. We didn't go anywhere. Uh, I went to the, the pool and I went to grocery stores. I didn't go anywhere else. We didn't go to a restaurant. The last yeah. restaurant I ate, ate at was in Marblehead. Well, well, we were in Salem that March that I talked about 2020 before mm -hmm. I came home. I don't remember the first time I went to a restaurant, you know, but, I, but it was a really long time afterwards, right? So as far as personal balance went, you know, it's like, you know, there were times when watching the news was kind of depressing because so many people were, were dying or suffering because of the coronavirus and because the economy was taking such a big hit. But in our mm -hmm. own little world, you know, we just stayed the course and tried to just be balanced. And, you know, happy hours continued. Those ones I talked about, it's just that, you know, maybe instead of drinking four, there were two, you know, whatever. It's like, all right, everybody cut back a little bit, you know, whatever. <laughs> so I hope that answers the question, but. but, you but did, yeah, this, this, is the, this was the first one that you answered very, very well. You answered it and without dancing around. So bravo, my friend, bravo. <laughs> um, uh, where do you think the industry is going now? Like you're in the volleyball industry. Um, you have the NCAA going on. You have the pandemic. You have like, but like, there's so much going on with everything in the world. Where do you see your industry going from here? Well, the sport of volleyball is a super popular um, sport on many levels. Boys volleyball, for example, in America is the second fastest growing boys sport after lacrosse. 
So boys, boys and men's volleyball is on a nice upward trajectory. Women's volleyball had fantastic TV ratings, for example, this spring. And um, with the Olympics coming up, I, our two Olympic teams, our men's indoor team may do well. Our women's indoor team is going to do great. Yeah. Uh, could win the gold medal. In fact, yeah. I would say the U.S. is a favorite for the gold medal. Those, those are all good things for us and volleyball in general. Um, you know, volleyball is just business as usual growing and, and will continue to grow. That part's good. And so translating that to volleyballmag.com, it, it will continue to grow because there'll just be more participants and more interest in it. And then beach volleyball has a lot going on. NCAA beach is one of the fastest growing sports in the NCAA. And then uh, yesterday, as a coincidence, we are this week, the AVP, which is the professional domestic tour for pro beach volleyball, got bought by Bally's, the casino and entertainment business. Wow. And so that's going to create a lot of new venues and a lot of uh, influx of money and opportunity. So the sport of volleyball is on totally upward trajectories in, in, in every way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing going on there where any bells are going off. So conversely for us, we think that, you know, we're, we're in a good place with that. And, you know, we, we, we love doing what we do. We love writing about it. It loves taking the pictures and writing. And we, we enjoy when people read it and are gratified and we know we've done a good job. I mean, that's, that's pretty much all it is, you know? I love it. All right. So now I we're done. That may feed into your last question. If I, recall. Like, I, I know <laughs> this is great. I go, now we're done. We are good. We are all, like, again, not our last conversation. Cause I kind of like you. You're kind of cool. I go, but this is going to be going into our last question. That the, this is the way I end with everyone. No matter how many times you talk to me, you will always hear these questions because um, you have to put out to the universe what you need. So if you had a personal ask and a professional ask of anyone that's listening to you right now, what would be your personal ask and what would be your professional ask? Two questions, please, Mr. Lee. Well, the, <laughs> um, well they're, they're actually intertwined because my personal being and my professional being, which is you know, writing, per se, which is ultimately what all this came about. You know, the reason I'm here with you is because small business writing, volleyballmag.com, you know, they're all intertwined for me. But from a professional end, obviously, if you um, are looking for a great outlet, we'd love for you to advertise on volleyballmag.com. We want your money. And one of the things that we've, I've never understood, it's, it's infuriating, is that the volleyball world is incestual and we don't get marketing and commercial opportunities outside of volleyball. And even with a, uh, like our national teams, you know, we don't have a, a major bank, a major hotel chain, um, a major airline, all those people that are never, you know, major grocery store chains. I've never understood why they don't latch onto this, you know, so volleyballmag.com is an excellent opportunity for you. And from a professional end, you know, I just always appreciate seriously when anybody reads one of my stories and likes it, you know, like I said, that story that people are spending seven minutes plus on that's, that's cool. That makes me feel good. Cause it know, I know that, you know, I've done good for the right reason, you know? And so when I write a good story, it's, it's the ultimate cheap thrill for me and a charge. You know, I love, you know, spending time writing something really good that's impactful, no matter what it is, and having people read it and then appreciate it. And, and even, you know, even the video interviews I do, it doesn't have to be just the written story, but, you know, from that end, or I love when, you know, locally, you know, my sports TV show and somebody say, Hey, I saw your interview with coach. So-and-so really liked it. It was really good when you guys talked about this. I, I like that. And so you're able to make a positive impact on people in its own little way that, that maybe other people can't do because you are a member of the media and you get to do that. And in my case, it's not life-changing media. It's not the real world. It's fun stuff. You're not going to read my volleyball stuff unless you're a volleyball fan and it's fun. So back to the original thing was it's fun and I'm lucky I get to do it. So, well, all right. So I, I, I do, I enjoy beach volleyball because I mean, um, back in the day, 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 my ex-boyfriend, I should say ex wife I call my ex love. Um, he like we, he lived in Santa Monica and we would go to tons of games on the beach. And I was like, I was the, the passion behind it was always amazing. I mean, I enjoyed the outdoor volleyball versus the indoor volleyball. Um, I, like being international, my dad's like, this, this sport was so much like, it should have been your sport because you're such an energizer bunny. You're bouncing around. This is your sport. I'm not going to lie. I'm a baby. It hurts. It hurt. And I'm like, and after it hurt enough times, I'm like, I'm not doing it. And my dad's like, but this could have been your sport. I'm like, I know it's just so sad. So I do enjoy watching any and all sports. I, I'm a, I mean, I'm a runner. Um, that's my sport. I enjoy running. Um, but I love watching 
team sports. I love what, what they give. And I love that you are teaching us to, even for individuals that are not in the sport, we're seeing different, in different ways. Um, I cannot wait to read the story about the, um, the, the Olympic winners that are in Maine. That for me is exciting because there's always another life. There's like so much more to one individual and that you are bringing that up for us. So um, kudos to that. Um, I will giggle because this was like a walking commercial for you, which is great. But the thing is, like, I'm laughing and giggling, but a lot of people, oh, wait, 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 wait. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people like, they're like, well, I don't want to sit there and showboat. I'm like, it's your business. And if you don't do it, who will? So I'm giggling, but I'm proud of you at the same time. Well, thank you. Did, did I ever mention to you in the course of this, though, that it's volleyballmag.com? <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Jody. Oh, my God, Lee, thank you so very much. And again, remember, this is not the last time that we're going to talk. You got it. Thank All you. All right. Have a wonderful day, my friend. Bye.